Hi, everyone, and welcome to today's session. Today, we are going to talk about a very interesting technology called Sora. So Sora was introduced by OpenAI sometime in February 2024, and it shows that it could generate high-quality, high-res videos just from a text prompt itself. And not only that, it can also do like you give it a starting video, you give a text prompt, and you can alter that video based on your text prompt. Not only that, you can give it two videos and it can interpolate between both videos. In fact, you can even give it a still image and ask it to generate a, a video based on that still image. So these are quite remarkable capabilities because previously, like Meta, or I think even Google, tried to do this kind of video generation from an image, but it's just only about three to four seconds. Sora can do like one minute. Yeah, so this is quite remarkable and it also can do with various resolutions. So how did they do this? Okay, we don't have the full answer today because Sora is a closed source model, but we can make a best guess at how they have done it based on other similar models. And I also suspect that they have some in-house methods that are not released. So later we can discuss more of that. You can also share your views. So today I treat it more like a sharing session. I will just highlight some of the key technologies behind this. And we can then discuss like how, how did they do this? And in fact, I'm quite motivated by this. I might go and train one myself, like a very, very small model on MNIST or something. Yeah. So how does Sora work? Let's take a look. All right. So this is the typical example that people use for Sora. All right. So this is on their front page on OpenAI. So you just take a look. This is the prompt on the right side. So the prompt is like a stylish woman walks down a Tokyo street filled with glowing, warm glowing neon and animated street signage. You can see this is captured very well in the picture. She wears a black leather jacket. Yes, is there a, a long red dress? Yes. Black boots and carries a black purse. And all of these features are there, which is actually remarkable because, you know, for this kind of um video conditioning, usually the text is not so long. <laughs> but you see Sora, Sora's prom is super long. Not only that, she, they also specify, oh, she wears sunglasses, red lipstick, walks confidently and casually, right? And actually all these are captured. Straight is dim and reflective, creating a mirror effect of the colorful lights. Yes, we can see that here. And many pedestrians walk about. And that's too. So over here, you can see that the camera angle changes. And there's nothing about camera here, but it somehow shows the zooming of the video. And I think that may be because like in example videos, perhaps this is how it's done. Uh, maybe not like that. Yeah, <laughs> so it has some work to do. So, so over here, there's quite a big abrupt jump. If, if you look over here, this was still okay. Then suddenly they zoom into the face for some reason. And this is not even in the prompt. So like from here to here, this is a bit weird, right? And I think this might be, you know, maybe a quote of like advertisement, you know, sometimes they do that. But Overall, the semantic quality of the video, you can see that the next frame follows the previous frame in quite a smooth manner. That is something that you may not get, like if you use other software, like, you know, Runway or other things like this. This is super cool. Like the way that it integrates, like even the walking motion or this, I honestly haven't seen such quality other than Sora. So how did they do all this? Let's take a look. Okay, so before we go into the details, uh, there are some limitations still with this technology. So OpenAI has quite generously highlighted the negative sites or the stuff that the model did not work so well on. Okay, so I think this one more researchers need to, to learn from it because in research papers, typically you don't have such negative stuff. We, we actually need to see all this. Okay, so, so this is great that OpenAI shared all this. So you can see over here that um, this is the person with the treadmill and can you see that he's running in the different direction? So usually treadmill will run towards the treadmill area. But over here, when Sora generated it, um, they generated him running in the opposite direction. I mean, it looks quite plausible. I mean, to be honest, if I'm a video generator and I don't know how the real world operates, a machine that runs in the opposite direction of the treadmill, I think that's perfectly plausible, right? You just need to change the track direction. So it probably can still understand physics in some sense. It's just that the physics may not match to the real world. So this is uh, a, an issue with like not an embodied agent okay, who doesn't really observe how the world works, just relying on videos. You know, sometimes you might misinterpret the world. And I think that's fine. I mean, overall, the emotion looks okay. Uh, there are some stuff that it still doesn't do so well though. Like 
over here, they asked to generate a dragon dance here. Can anyone spot what's wrong with this picture? Yeah, maybe I just pause here for a while. Anyone want to like uh, try it? <laughs> the poll. Uh, the, yes. The Chinese character is wrong. This one? Yes. Okay. Yeah, that may be one thing. Actually, I don't know what's the original. So it may not be great at languages. It doesn't see that that well, uh, that, that often. So maybe this one is a complicated Chinese character that is like not the common ones. Anyone anyone else wants to highlight some errors? Because yes. holding the pole is not supporting the dragon itself. Yes, very good. Yeah, so this one actually in the earlier part of the image, it was, but after that, when the video went through, um, the pole got further and further away. <laughs> uh, there's still some more. Anyone else wants to highlight? Okay, if not, let me just bring your attention to this. So you see this set of hands here? Actually, this set of hands belong to this person here. So there's a duplicate set of hands. So um, overall, the semantic meaning of the dragon dance is preserved. Like you can see that the dragon follows this shape. Yeah, it's not bad. Even the dragon teeth looks very clear and stuff like that. But it's just the minor stuff, like you know how the hands uh, align to the uh, dragon and so on. You know, sometimes it might generate plausible stuff here, but it doesn't match with the rest of the object here. Okay, same thing over here. This person is generated quite well, but the pole is not matched with the dragon. So it has a great understanding of local pixel level stuff. Or rather, because it's not in the pixel space, in, in the latent space, it has great understanding of like how like maybe the hands are supposed to look like, the person is supposed to look like. But you know, in this kind of noble situations when the object's interacting with something else, okay, I use a different color. The object is interacting with something else, like this pose, I will go to the dragon. You know that that may not be captured very well, and you know I I suspect that you know if you write in the prompt like the pole must be attached to the dragon, I, I suspect that that would solve it, but it just shows that natively, we cannot just use Sora to you know just model the world like that because this may be quite different from how the real world looks. It looks largely similar, but there's there's some minute differences. Okay, but you know, compared to previous video generation models, this is a huge breakthrough. You look at the details of the people over here, it's, it's quite clear. Like, I mean, I could zoom in and could see the eyes, the nose, and the mouth. And you know, if you look at the hands, there should be five fingers. So, I mean, last time when um, Mid Journey or Stable Diffusion first came out, you know, people used to joke that you can tell an AI image just by looking at the fingers, right? Like, if there's four or six fingers, then it's an AI generated image. So, this um, the hand generation is actually not bad. Yeah, I mean, it looks like a hand. So there's quite a lot of improvements here, but we are not there yet in terms of a very accurate video generation to model the world. Right, so what is Sora? So Sora is fundamentally a diffusion model. Okay, so diffusion is a very difficult word to understand, but what exactly is diffusion? Okay, diffusion is like this, okay? Let's, let me draw you an image here. So let's say in the image domain, okay, of course, when they did um, diffusion, they don't do on the pixel space, but let's just view it in the pixel space. So what is diffusion here? So let me just draw like an image of maybe a, a smiley face. So this is the smiley face that we want to predict, right? So eventually we want to predict that it's a smiley face. Okay, but at the start here, what happens is that we purposely add in something called noise. Okay, what is noise? So noise is like you just randomly, you know, draw some, um, you know, just just make 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 some. They add Gaussian noise, and Gaussian noise just means like a noise that is like over a certain distribution. Uh, basically, it's just just like you, if you take your spectacles and you just put some dirt over it, you know, it's, it it kind of looks like that. So what we want to do is, you know, predicting from a very noisy image all the way to a very clean image is a difficult task because, like if. If you just give, if I just give you an image like that, like <laughs> you can't see anything. There's no smiley face at all. And I tell you, you know, like you're supposed to predict a smiley face. It's super tough. It's like okay, if you ask someone to, you know, um, count the sum from one to one thousand. All right, one plus two plus three plus four until one thousand. You ask straight away. You ask someone to do that. It's a very difficult process. But if you know, if I split the problem up and ask you to count what, what is one plus two, you can give me the answer three. Then why is why is three plus three and six? Why is six plus four ten? And so if you like split the problem up into small little bite-sized stuff, uh, instead of just going from the very, very noisy 
predict uh, noisy image, you try to predict the not so noisy image. You know, if I just give you uh, an intermediate task, like say, hey, you know, just, just predict this one, like a noisy image to a not so noisy image. Then I apply the same model again recursively, not so noisy image predict the denoise image. So you can do this multiple times. Eventually, the more you do it here, the, the more you know, crypts your image will be because there's less and less noise. And, and the beauty is that you can start with a random set of noise here and you can get different images at the end. So that's like how stable diffusion works. You just seed it randomly with a random starting noise image. And then you slowly denoise it until you get a very clear image. So that is diffusion for images. Okay, so Sora is different. Sora is diffusion for videos. <laughs> so videos is actually like a set of images. So it's a, 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 a more, lot more complex because there's a lot more information to capture in a video. Okay, so um, Jeff Ko, you asked, what is the meaning of stable in stable diffusion? Uh, that's a great question. Um, it's because in the past, diffusion was done in the pixel space, like here. So this is the pixels. Uh, what is the pixel space? Okay, there are two spaces here. So later I'll be emphasizing this also. There's pixel space and there's latent space. Okay, so what is the difference between these two? The pixel space is basically like the red, green, blue pixels, you know, every computer image you have pixels. And then you can characterize your pixels with like red, green, blue, and transparency. So that, that's pixel space. But you know, in the latent space, so pixel space is quite high dimension because every pixel you have 255 times 255 times 255 possibilities if you ignore the, the transparency. Okay, that's very high dimension because like that's a huge number. You know, if you use transformers, you predict the text token, that's only about 60,000 tokens. This is like 100 over 1,000. I, I don't know the exact sum, but it's a huge number and that's only one pixel. Imagine predicting that for every single pixel, pixel of your image. And if let's say you are doing 2048 by 2048 pixels, which is quite high res, that easily is trillions of different predictions you need to make. Yeah, so that is difficult in a pixel space. But you know, in the real world, like certain images don't appear, like you don't see random noise all the time. Like what you will normally see is that, you know, you will see that, let's say if you are doing MNIST data set, okay, you will see that the number one appears like that. And you know, generally the object flow follows a smooth edge, like, and you, you normally don't see very drastic changes in the pixel as you as you go from parts to parts. Like you look at this turtle over here, um, it's, it's quite smooth, right? Like if you look over here, this you, you don't expect to see like a turtle like that. Like you, you don't you don't see this unless it is like a distorted picture or anything. So if you think about it, if you can somehow map, okay, uh okay, not, not map like that, map something like this. Okay, so this is the pixel space. You map it to the, the latent space. You can somehow map this uh, like image of one into a latent space that maybe, if let's say your latent space only contains two axes, you can say that this region here is one. Okay, so let, let's say we have X and Y here. We can say this region is one. We can have another region for two. We can have another region for three and so on. So instead of representing an image, as a very high dimensional domain of each pixel, you could, you know, if you can have a way to map it to a latent space that is a bit low dimension, but it can still capture most of what the picture is because like, for example, for MNIST, we wouldn't expect the numbers here to be like this, right? So the numbers would generally be quite smooth. You wouldn't expect the numbers to be like that, right? Like, you know, you wouldn't expect the numbers to, to, to look like that. Yeah, this is not expected. So, you know, this is probably not a valid image. So you can you can throw that away. And in the latent space, you know, you just only need to model what is model only what is uh realistic in, in latent space. You can throw away a lot of the search space because you just don't get that in real life. So that's the difference between pixel and latent space. Uh is that clear? Yes, thanks. Can I also ask, uh, is is by 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 that explanation, does that mean that latent space is something like uh, vector graphics? Uh, not exactly. So a latent space is, you know, uh, transformer token embeddings. So yeah. uh, 
they are like a vector of n dimensions. So in, in stable diffusion, it's a five one two dimensions. So it's like what, what they do is basically map the the input domain of the pixel space into some very, very um concise representation of 512 numbers. And these 512 numbers will characterize how the image looks like. And based on this, a very, very important thing, there must be a way to map back. And then this will give you back the pixel space. So the latent space cannot be any random latent space. It needs to preserve the information enough such that you can um, get back quite reliably how the image actually looks like in the first place. So this is going to be tough. Um, you will definitely lose out some information about the original image when you go into latent space. But the hope is that this latent space is good enough so that most features of your original image is preserved. And instead of working in the pixel space, which is very complex, takes a long time to, to get it right, you can move, you can work in the latent space, which is actually quite smooth also, because like if you transit from like this point here, yeah, I use a different color. You transit from this point of the latent space to another point here in the latent space. Maybe the image will go from like this one to, to like, 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 like that one. Yeah. So it's it's a smooth transition. I and mean, if you look at like how, like if you use the variational auto encoders, uh, just go and search variational auto encoders. Uh, variational auto encoders, like in the latent space, if you just drag from one point to another point, you see the pixel space, it shifts pretty gently and smoothly. So in some sense, the errors in your latent space, okay, it's not as severe as the error in your pixel space. So if your pixel, you predict this patch wrongly here, if you predict this patch wrongly, the image is going to look like, like it will look horrible. Like if this one becomes a, like you put some other pixel here, the number one will look weird because this is a wrong pixel. But if you predict something a little wrongly in the latent space, your one will still look like this. Like you'll still look okay because the latent space is a bit more smooth in terms of the transition of your pixels. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Thanks so much. No worries. Yeah. So the latent space is a huge breakthrough for stable diffusion. Uh, stable diffusion, actually, the diffusion methods are, are not new. Okay. They actually took from previous paper like the denoising diffusion models and so on. Uh, in fact, I think those are still too complicated. <laughs> you don't need so much math for diffusion. You just need to remove the noise step by step. You just do this forward prediction here is good enough. That, that my opinion, all right? So, uh, so stable diffusion breakthrough is that it manages to do it in latent space. It manages to do this noise removal in latent space, which turns out to be a great idea because it reduces the compute. It also makes the image look much nicer because you can get, uh, like, as I said, if you just put up a little bit in your latent space, the image still looks okay, right? So what is Sora building on, okay? So Sora is building on a diffusion model. Uh, just note that this diffusion model may not be the actual stable diffusion, okay? I suspect it's more towards the doll E series of, of, of OpenAI. I think it's more towards the doll E. Uh, later, if you have time, I can go through some of the differences between stable diffusion and doll E series, but... The idea is the same. The idea is that they take in the latent space a noisy patch of latent space and they try to denoise it step by step, step by step until you reach a clear latent space, which you can map back to something that is you know, relatively nice like this, this turtle here. The difference is that instead of one single image, Sora does it for the entire video. And not only that, they can also do it for different image resolutions and aspect ratios, all right? So this is quite cool because, you know, typically people will just square crop the center of the video here and then just use that as a fixed representation for your, your input for the image. In fact, for different resolutions, they will just compress the image and fit it into that square anyway. So, you know, you, you might lose out stuff like, you know, it might be too squish or you, when you compress it like that, you, you lose out the, the scenery at the outside here, which is not desired because when you want to train on like image text data or video text data, you do kind of want to keep as much information as possible. You don't want to throw away the outside here because you know training data is valuable. But if your model only can take in a square image, all right, maybe because of your convolutional neural networks, you want to take in that same same patch, you know, you kind of throw away some data. But for Sora, um, they don't do that. They take in the entire image with the native aspect ratio. 
aspect ratio is like the height to the width. Okay, for those who don't know aspect ratio, this uh the width to the height, that's the aspect ratio. And the image resolution is like how many pixels are there in the image. And all these are preserved. So let's find out how they do it. Uh, before I, I, I move on, any other questions on the the broad overview of like what Sora is doing? All good? Okay, let's move on. So uh, this is basically a, a slide I wanted to highlight over here. So the transformer is key to this whole thing because this transformer is helping the model do the prediction. So traditional large language model is like, you know, I am a, then you have a token here, or then you can predict like student, cat, dog, you know, that kind of thing. Yeah, so you can train it on the world's data by just predicting like the next token. And this helps to helps to give semantic meaning to the embedding space of each token. Because as you train over the world's data, you know, you will learn, okay, what's a cat, what's a dog, what's a student, where it occurs, what words it occurs with, and through the self-attention mechanism of the transformer. So I'm not going to go through the details of self-attention today. If you're interested, you can see my video on ChatGPT. But the idea is through this uh, mixed token prediction over the entire web's worth of text, you are able to get the meaning of the of the tokens itself. Uh, yeah, do you have for you ask, uh, does latent space contain semantic meaning? Yes. So this latent space is supposed to contain semantic meaning so that, you know, if you warp it a little bit here and there, like, you no, know, uh, the typical example for word embeddings is like this. You have uh, a word here, like, called man. And yeah, I think for most of you here, you should have seen this before, but I'm just going to go through this anyway. So uh, this is the typical example that people have used for, like, word embeddings, like man, women, king, queen. So the thing is, because of the, the way that we map this latent space here, like this vector representation from king to queen is the same as men to women. So you could get a vector such as like, you know, queen equals to uh, women minus man plus king. So the vector embedding of your this word itself can shift along by just doing this kind of stuff. Like, like this is the embedding space. And the... The traditional way of learning this is like glove embeddings and you know word to back. Uh, but all these are proven to be like inferior to like LM based methods like chat GPT, like GPT. Yeah. Or or but you know, if you want to talk about but it's is a Google model. Uh, but people normally just use GPT nowadays, like the next token prediction kind of thing. So what this means is that, you know, just by observing the next word, you can update the semantic meanings of your tokens for your text. Okay, so I suspect that since Sora is a video prediction model, it, it kind of is doing the same thing. So imagine this is your video frame, okay? So this is your video frame number one, okay? Let, let's call it V1. And then we have a video frame number two. And then we kind of have a video frame number three. Okay, sometimes you have a text description of your whole video, sometimes you don't. Okay, so let's say we have text description of video. It's like maybe a turtle swimming in the sea. So you, you can condition on the text description here for each of this, uh, for like each of this, this, this video frame. So we'll have the text description as well as the input. Okay, what we'll do is that, you know, suppose we have uh, an unknown frame here, V4. How can you predict this um and I, I i think that this is the same thing right so what you can do is you can just give the model like this frames v1 v2 v3 the image frames okay let me just highlight here these are image frames like a still image and then you can ask the model to predict this image and this kind of is able to train on the web's worth of video data because you can just pause the video anytime you predict the next frame pause the video predict the next frame and this is actually if Sora did it like that. Okay, it's not in their technical paper at all, but I suspect they could do this because of the way they have structured the Sora array. Okay, I'll show you the array later. But you can predict the next image like that by just you know giving it random noise here, you know, and, and then uh, seeing the transformer output. Yeah, because you have the ground truth for this. In training set, you have ground truth. So what you need to do is just blank off that part of the image, make it random noise and stuff, and then you just you know, you just do a, a loss function to, to make um, the prediction 
similar to ground truth. And um, this similar to ground truth is, of course, is going to be in latent space. Okay, so anything you learn about stable diffusion is that predicting in pixel space is horrible. So every single prediction objective will be in latent space. Okay, so I suspect this is what is done in Sora. Sora can predict videos forward. It can fill up the next few frames. And if, you, if your prediction objective is a frame by frame objective, you know, it kind of makes the image smoother, right? Because like the video is smoother because if you're just predicting one frame at a time, I think I think you won't get very uh, weird jumps. Like just now you saw the, the woman walking in the Tokyo streets, right? Very, very smooth interpolation of your frames. And you know, if you do something like this, just predict the next frame, similar to predicting the next token, it becomes very smooth because like even for chat GBT, when you generate the sentence, it feels very smooth, right? Because it has conditioned on all the earlier text as your context. And then it can generate the next token with respect to that context. So same thing for video. If you condition on all these earlier frames, you can generate the next frame quite smoothly. But that's not all that Sora can do again. Okay? Sora can also do backwards. So let's say you have V0. You know, you could actually do a prediction objective backwards as well. You can also. And like how, how this is done is probably they make that image layer at the front random noise again. And they give the ground truth and they ask to do uh, like a loss function to make the prediction similar to ground truth. So if anything, right, anything that powers like AGI or very high technology, it's just, you know, <laughs> you know just to put it bluntly, you can just say AGI is next token prediction. Uh, I mean, not, not AGI, but you know, generic models generic model is just next is next token prediction because like we 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 don't have a no specific task just the next token prediction no next frame prediction i think we can get somewhere really quickly because you can train on the web's data you don't have to input your specific biases you just train on the web's data length of one frame as ground truth you know if you want to do like bird objective you can also blank off the middle frames but I don't think that's advisable because in real life, rarely you see something blank off in the middle, then you see the back maybe in the middle. Rarely you see that. In life, time flows in a continuous stream. You just have to predict the next time step. You, you don't like predict in the middle of your of your memory. So I think the next token objective is a good one. Um, this previous token objective, well, you don't exactly predict backwards. <laughs> do, you, do you predict your memory backwards like you? You see an event and you try to back predict what's happening rarely. Okay, so this back prediction, I don't fully agree with this. I think we probably only do forward prediction. But you know, for the purpose of video, we want to feel in the back, feel in the front, you know, this works. But for human cognition, I think we only predict the forward. Yeah. So this is one of the reasons why I think Sora is so powerful compared to all the existing text to video things out there, is they probably probably do some form of next frame prediction. And this next frame prediction is done in the latent space. And that's not all. They actually do a patch prediction problem. So not just the whole image as the full image itself, they actually split the image into patches. And what is this patches? And that's what I'm going to cover next. Uh, but before that, uh, any questions so far for what I'm talking about? Uh, if you understand, can uh, maybe give a thumbs up or something. So I, I'm. I'm confident that whatever I explained makes sense. I I I are, are good with the explanation for for this so far. Uh, can uh, I just ask a quick one? Uh, so latent space is basically a form of vector space. Is that correct? Yes. So a latent space is a vector. In this case, for stable diffusion, it's a vector of five one two numbers. So the vector space people normally like to draw as a hot dog with uh, with many lines. Uh, rather, it's like a, a a long column, and the latent space is typically in this format, like one point zero two. Uh, minus 0 0.5 so like yeah. you can yeah. yeah so this is the latent space yeah got it thanks yeah same thing for tokens you can also do latent space for patches okay i'm going to move on okay because we have quite a lot of stuff to cover so what is patches what are patches so um this idea of patch is something from this paper called vision transformer uh an image is worth 16 by 16 words, okay? Well, why did they say that? Because they split the image into, you know, 16 by 16 squares, right? but, you know, <laughs> and they, they say each, each square is like a token in the, in, in, in the traditional word sense. So that's why the paper is called an image is worth 16 by 16 words. Uh, I actually don't like this paper <laughs> because I don't like this objective here. You know, 
um, it's something that Yen Le Kun said, you know, like Yen Le Kun said before. Right? Let me just quote him, all right? And um, said supervised learning. Anyone to fill in the blank here? <laughs> so you know, you know this? What, what does Yen Le Kun say about supervised learning? Ah, uh, I can't remember. Sucks. He says supervised learning sucks. He also says RL sucks, by the way, which I both agree. So um, ImageNet is uh, 1,000 different classes and you know, if you train your ResNet, residual networks on ImageNet, you can only predict those 1,000 classes well. Okay, outside of those classes, you can't do it well okay, because you just don't have information about this. So uh, Vision Transformer is trained using a supervised learning over some classes, you know, which kind of hinders the, the way that they can learn. I, I don't agree with this method of learning at all. So eh, this is not good. <laughs> Uh, but they have proposed an idea that, you know, at first I didn't really fully agree, but now the more I think about it, the more I agree with it, um, is to patch, patchify the image. And then what is to patchify the image? It's like this, you have an image like that. Then you split the image like a jigsaw puzzle, you know, you just split the top part of the image one by one, you take it out, and then you get these little patches here. And each patch, you encode them in a, in a similar way. So just to highlight the way we process each patch is the same. And this is somewhat like convolutional neural networks, right? You have a filter that you process the same way over the entire image. Here, we process each patch in the same way. So now that I think about it more, I kind of agree with it because, you know, in your eyes, let's say I draw an image of your eye over here. Also, as you can see, I'm quite a like, biological person. I like to compare all this to... to to like biological systems. So in the eye, you know, when you have rods and cones, that kind of suck at drawing this, but you know, if let's say you have rods and cones, okay, maybe the tall one is the, 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 the rod and the, the small one are the cones. Um, each of the rods and cones have a limited focal view, which means that they only see a small part of the world. Okay, so if you think that you see the whole well, you know, that's wrong. Okay. Actually, our eyes make circuits that you, you kind of stitch together to form your view. So it could very well be in our brains that when we view the world, we view them in small little patches or so, and then we try to fill in what each patch is and, you know, get you the whole image. So what's the beauty of, of splitting into patches is that if you split them into patches, you could actually, you know, split a very difficult problem into a simpler one. So it's like, if let's say I want to find out what's the image over here, instead of finding out the all the whole image itself, you know, I could just split the prediction problem into like, hey, uh, what is this? Oh, this one looks like um, maybe this is the top of building, you know? And then like, because the processing power for each of them will be smaller because like this one looks like, oh, maybe this is like many, many white buildings, like maybe front of building. Yeah, so you could like each of them could come up with some, um, some resolution about what that image is, and then all can group together again, share information, and then say, oh, okay, this is a building. Okay, so it is like divide and conquer. Okay, uh, but there's something wrong with vision transformers, okay? So today is not a bashing session for vision transformers, but just to highlight, you know, um, sometimes your object may be an object only at a macro scale. Like if let's say you have a person, right? Or your image is like a person over here. You don't want to split the person into like head, hands, and legs. I mean, of course, you can also predict that because, you know, if you group together the parts, you, you can. But sometimes, you know, your patch might be bigger, like this level of patch. So if you could have a way to, you know, get different patches, I, I think this vision transformer is actually quite good. I'm not sure if Sora does different size patches, but there have been work extending on vision transformers that, you know, um, use different scales for patches. And if you look at the visual cortex, there's also like V1, V2, V4. You know, sometimes the connection might skip directly from your input into V4 directly, yeah, which means that, you know, you can process at different scales. So, uh, yeah, but the idea of patches is probably an interesting one. And the way that we enforce each patch processing to be the same is probably a good one as well, because whatever each patch learns, we can apply to every single patch and, you know, it learns faster. Okay, so this is uh, about patches. Uh, question so far? Okay, so how do we interpret patches in vision transformers? Okay, I'm delving a little deeper here because um, I'm quite sure that Sora uses vision transformers. I mean, they said that they use patches, so what else could it be, right? Yeah, so this is 
patch number 12. So this is an image that I got from this uh, very nice blog post. You can check it out yourself if you're interested. So they took an image, pixelized it, and then they have this patch here. What they do is that they flatten the patch first. And then you can see like if you flatten the patch and you go from left to right for each column like that, for each row like that, you will get like something like that. Like these are the different columns. And then you can see that, you know, the whole image uh, is sort of represented in, in this, this line here. So a bit weird, a bit weird because we lose out the 2D representation. We go into a, a flattened view. And that's also probably why vision transformers, you know, um, take much more training samples than competitional neural networks because the CNN preserves the 2D view vision transformers just say, hey, you know what? I'm just going to flatten it. Yeah, so so that, that's probably something that could be improved. But, you know, all in all, you know, splitting the patches and applying the same processing algorithm, that, that that's generally a good idea. After we flatten this patch here, we could also do some projection of this patch into some embedding layer. So rather than keeping the original pixels here, you know, if let's say your embedding layer is like a, a stable diffusion, you only want like 512 dimension, okay? You can actually do, uh, like this is called, uh, so let's say your original dimension is like 400. So this is your 400 dimension vector. You could actually do a projection matrix here to make it 512 vector. And you know how, how this typically done is, is you just take certain weight matrix. And you know, if your weight matrix here is of size, you know, 400 by 502, and this weight is fully learnable. They always call this a linear projection matrix in, in the image literature. So I'm just gonna use the same terms. So this is called the linear projection matrix. You can just take uh like whatever you have for the original one. So let's say your original image is of vector, you know, this is your original image is of vector, you know, like four hundred by you know some something, you know. You can just take this multiplied by the weight matrix, or maybe you just take x times four hundred. You can just take this multiplied by this, and then we get the resultant matrix. We we get something like this, x five one two. So you know you, you this x is like the for each of this pixel here, you, you know, you, you have some value or some dimension here. Okay, so I might I might get some of the math wrong, but the, the main thing is that your dimension, you can map it from one dimension to another dimension, you know, independent of this, this number here. You can map it using some weight matrix. And this means that you can express whatever you have in the earlier part of your model into something that is suitable of the same size in the later part of the model just by doing this mapping, this linear projection matrix. And uh, to be fair, this is not a new concept. Transformers use this all the time. If you look at the transformer architecture, every time you go to the query key and value, you also do a linear projection into it. Yeah, so this is uh, not, not new per se, um, but the idea is that through patch uh, interpretation, you can take the patch of the vision transformer and then you can map it to a different embedding. And the embedding space might be more suitable for your resultant part of the processing. And yeah, this is exactly what Vision Transformers does. They take each patch here, they map it to some embedding space, and then you can continue using the transformer architecture to process it. Just, you can treat this. So eventually, the main thing is that you can, you can treat this whole thing as an embedding or as a token embedding. Treat this whole patch as a token embedding. And, and that's the beauty of like vision transformers in the sense that it makes vision prediction something like word prediction because essentially this whole patch here becomes like a token embedding in the traditional transformer sense. Okay, uh, questions on this? All, all, all good? Do you think just by merely increasing the training data size, it can get away with the problem of a lot uh, of the, the local information loss i'm uh, sorry the spatial information loss. Mm. you mean spatial information as in the 2d information loss right yes no <laughs> i i i think that is something that vision transformers are not good at yeah i so, think they have to have some other tricks right they have a row embedding and column embedding i mean you could do that but i think um losing the 2d structure would cause certain issues but apparently 
those issues are mitigated by large scale training data. And yeah, I mean, so you think it can help? It can mitigate the issue. Yeah, unless someone invents a you know two D vector transformer, you know, like you can preserve the spatial, um, the the two D spatial thing and still do transformer operations on it. You know, then then that would probably help more rather than just giving like a row embedding and column embedding for each or give it a like row embedding for each row and add it here. I, I think that's just a mitigating measure. So this 2D structure thing, I haven't quite figured out like how, how best to do it. But one thing about the vision transformer is that because it matched to the transformer architecture, they're able to utilize the transformer power to to, to process yeah, it. But I think they have to, they definitely have kept some secret sauce. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, there's some work that, you know, people use comp nets first, then after that, do vision transformers. Mm. Yeah, so you can preserve the 2D space by putting in some feature space and then go to vision transformers. Uh, the downside of this is that comp net might lose information because when you do your filter operation in comp net, um, you actually, you know, um, make make the image lower lower res in some sense because you, you, you kind of combine, aggregate the pixels. So... You might lose certain things here, but one one thing to be done is like this: your original image, you go through ComNet and the vision transformer, and then what you can do is, uh, you know, apply the good old skate connection, and you can go. <laughs> yeah, so so this is possible also. Yeah. So there's many ways to do image processing. Yeah. Um. So vision transformer doesn't have the two D two D aspect. So be it. I mean, I, I, I was okay. Yeah. But another question is when I, well, I myself read the the blog right. I thought by next quote unquote token prediction, I was thinking more of like predicting along the time axis. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. So so that was that was what I explained earlier, right? Next frame prediction is along the time axis. But I'm I'm just explaining what's a part of patch is because they don't predict the whole image at one go, they predict each patch separately. Okay. Yeah. Okay, so all clear so far about the patch. So the patch is just a way to translate an image into uh, a token space for transformers. Good. Okay, so this is Sora, all right? So um, just to quote that, what they did for the website, all right, in the Sora webpage, at high level, we turn videos into patches by first compressing videos into a lower dimension latent space and subsequently decomposing the representation into space times patches. You know, I really like this word, you know, it's like, in the past, we had this thing called back propagation through time. It sounds like time travel. And now we have space time patches. So it sounds quite cool, right? Yeah. So <laughs> why is space time patches? So I think Einstein will be quite proud of it because it, you know this is a space dimension one, a space dimension two, space dimension one, and we have time dimension here. So this is time means basically um a set of images that you know goes through some progression. Is basically if you think about it, you know, video is just a collection of images. Yeah, you can, you know, this is how people do stop uh, stop motion films, right? You just draw each each frame and then you just flip a book. <laughs> yeah, so, so essentially we can just take slices of the video as an image and then you can put each slice of the image as um like slice one can be this this row here, slice two can be the row at the back, I mean the, the, the plate at the back, slice three can be the plate at the back or so, and so on. Of course, this is simplified. I don't think they actually do that okay, because it's just too expensive to do so many slices. All right, videos can be one minute long. Uh, that's huge. I mean, if you look at the video size of a 2048 by 2048 over one minute, you know, if you do that in the transformer, you will you will get you you'll you'll burst the transformer. Yeah, our transformer cannot handle such high data rates yet. All right. So but the main idea is that we they turn this video into this space time predict uh space time patches. And then you know if you just make this last 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 frame noisy, you know if you if you make this last uh last uh, 2D block noisy, you can predict this 2D block. And then this essentially is next frame prediction. Okay, but they don't do next frame di prediction directly because predicting the whole image can be a tricky task. But you know if you predict patch by patch, maybe that's better. Yeah. So I think this is something that uh that Sora does differently from like stable diffusion and whatever. So stable diffusion, dog E series. You know, um, so far it's like they don't use they don't use patches. They just take like comments usually. Yeah. So this is quite a big departure from the usual way of doing the um 
the, the diffusion. And you know, very likely Sora may not even use a unit. Because when you just put everything into transformers like that, the transformer can perform the role of the unit. Uh, there's this paper called Diffusion Transformers um, that says that you know the, the transformer architecture is superior to a unit. Okay, so I don't know whether all of y'all know about units, but a unit is basically you do something like this. You start with an image with a high dimension. So it is your image. And this dimension is like maybe one zero two four. Um, you know, you could do some further processing into another layer of one zero two four, and then you can do down sampling into a layer of five one two. So I'm just going to draw like one layer of unit just for convenience, and then this five one two can process into another layer of five one two. Then you can then do up sampling into back into one zero two four again, and then you can do another layer of processing and so on. You can do many layers of processing, but the idea behind unit's is that you can down sample and up sample. And you know, eventually you will use this for some prediction objective, be it like predicting segments of the image, predicting like what class which pixel is, and so on. Uh, earlier use for image segmentation, this unit works quite well for and there's this very important connection uh, connection here is the scape connection. You know, I think if anything that uh <laughs> that powers deep learning right now is this scape connection, you know, because like Skip connection allows you to take all the previous information and put into the next layer. Okay, why, why is this good? All right, this is because like once you go down to a lower level of representation, you are forced to compress, forced to keep only important information. So it's like a bottleneck. So maybe when you do this unit architecture, you go down into a, in a lower dimension, you're forced to you know, interpret like, hey, uh, where are my main objects of the image? Or hey, what's the, the main background, you know? Then when you go back up here, you can use that to condition your generation to say, hey, you know, um, you know, maybe this is in the C, you know, then generate something based on this. So it's some false compression that somehow leads to context being abstracted into more and more. So as you compress the unit more and more, my hypothesis is that the unit representation becomes more and more generic, more and more abstract, like less from the pixel space, but more to the higher level concepts. And they can use these higher level concepts to, you know, condition your earlier layers. So there's also this idea of a uh, feature pyramidal network. That's quite 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 good in each domain also. It also works by um, by compression and uh, re getting back the pixel space. So the idea of um, compressing and coming back again is is quite a quite a powerful one in image. But diffusion transformers don't use it. <laughs> they say the transformer can already do that. All right, so this is something I read yesterday and I think that's quite cool. Like, you know, maybe the transformer operation itself, you know, cross attention and so on can do something like what this unit is doing. You know, so, you know, maybe transformers can do everything. <laughs> everything can be a transformer, yeah. So that is uh, something interesting. But that's uh, not the main focus for today. The main focus is that we can encode the image into this space-time patches. And this space-time patches consists of a uh, space dimension like that and a time dimension here. And essentially what we can do is we can flatten this whole 3D block into a one-dimensional array. So, you know, earlier, uh, sorry, we were talking about, you know, how, um, how, how vision transformers, you know, lose info of, of the 2D space. You know, this, this, <laughs> this is going to lose info of the time space as well. So how? So one mitigation is time embeddings. Yeah, maybe you could add time embeddings into the later layers. And also like if you have row embeddings and so on, you can also add in row embeddings. So um, what people have found out for like transformers is that if you lose certain info, you just put them as embeddings. Like if you lose information of the position of the token, put position embeddings. You lose information of the row, put row embeddings. You know, as long as this row position and like time embeddings, they are of a different frequency in the cosine and sine wave, you know, it shouldn't interfere. So I don't quite like this method, but that's uh it works, it works now. So you know, we're just gonna flow with it. <laughs> so maybe they lose information by compressing into this 1D array, but they put more and more embeddings there to preserve those information. Why not? Okay. I mean Sora works pretty well, so I'm just gonna assume that stuff like this could work, could preserve the stuff. 
Okay, questions before I move on. Okay, so what are the steps needed to go from this video into this space time patches, which is quite cool, by the way, like space time patches. So um, the first step in the, so all this is on the website. So the first step that they say is that they have a network that reduces the dimensionality of the visual data. So I suppose this is not the vision transformer step yet because reducing the dimensionality of vi visual data can be done before applying the vision transformer, like patchify operation to make it the patches. You, you can do this with something like a variational autoencoder or a vector quantized variational autoencoder. These are the two main methods used so far, VQ, VAE. So vector quantized basically just means that instead of just only having one layer, you can have multiple layers um, of representation, like right? using some vector representation at the top level and the bottom level and so on. So if you're interested, you can go and take a look at those uh, papers talking about it. But the main thing is that assume I have a method that can be trained to take like maybe only the high frequency bits and put them into a latent space that is much smaller than the original pixel space. So, you know, earlier I talked about how the digits of MNIST, you know, the one usually appears as a straight line. You can throw away all the stuff that one with a wiggly line and so on. Yeah, sure, you will not predict as well as, you know, those wiggly lines, but most of the data set wouldn't contain that. Most of the things in the world wouldn't contain that. So I think it's safe to throw away most of it. So when you throw away most of it, you can reduce the dimensionality of the data. And this is a huge plus, okay? Because why is it a huge plus? Because this thing here means that if we predict wrongly, the impact on pixel space is less, right? Because if we throw away all the irrelevant stuff, you know, you, you, you put up a little wrongly in the latent space here, um, you can still get quite good images back because your latent representation, you throw away all the stuff. So when you get back, maybe you only get straight lines for one. Yeah. So it is a, it's a plus. So, and there's also another plus here is that um, the other plus is uh, you reduce the the um, space time patches size, which also means that uh, less compute. So, you know, when you can compress stuff, you just go ahead and do it. The brain does it all the time. We always, um, we don't remember the full details of our input stimuli. You look at your memories, you don't remember pixel perfect view of whatever you see. You just remember big impressions of it. We do compression all the time because this brain here is uh, much uh, less than, like, you throw all the compute of the world. That, that's probably more compute than our heads already. Like, alpha go, alpha zero, more compute than the human mind. All right, so we, we, we can do a lot of things, but we only use such a small brain to do it. And, um, there's a lot of compression going on. And so if you can compress it well, you know, and the thing is, I think in our brains, we don't seek to reconstruct pixel level prediction, but in this artificial construct of a video prediction or image prediction, we want to go back here. So this reduced dimension cannot throw away everything. You know, when we go back, we still want to see maybe a butterfly. We still want to see the corals here, but you know, your coral position may not be exactly the same, but you still want to preserve those kind of aspects. So, uh, using something like variational autoencoders or V2VAE, you try to train a latent space that preserves as much information that um, maintains the original image. I mean, there could be other methods as well, but the main thing is you find a method that reduces the dimension to go into this compressed space. And you know what's the beauty of this is that, you know, your, your transformer, later on when you use the transformer, may not even know it's a video. <laughs> It, to, to, to them, it may not even be this pixel. It might just be some vectors. And it doesn't matter because transformers work on any kind of input as long as there's some semantic meaning to it. So this compressed space may not even look like a video to us anymore. But transformers can still do it, right? So how do they do this? They take in raw video as input, outputs a latent representation that is compressed both temporally and spatially. So I guess a v, v, VAE can do that as well, yeah? You know, you could you could do that uh, separately for each uh, time frame, and then, you know, you could then again do that in time-wise compression. So you can do two steps, or, you know, if there's another method that can do this in one step, it's fine also. Uh, I I don't know any uh, VQ, VAE for video right now, but if you do, feel free to, to let me know as well. So the idea is they compress in both time domain here and the space domain. Right. And then Sora is trained in this compressed latent space. 
So as I said earlier, the Sora may not even know that it's a video. It just knows that it's some vector space that is already compressed. And the main thing is that this latent space must be able to map back. Okay, this is very important because if you can't map back, then you can uh you can just quit already because the pro problem that we want to do is to predict the back this video space. If if your latent space loses so much information that the the pixel space information is gone completely, then you know you, you don't need to do the rest of Sora anymore. So this video compression step quite powerful, quite important also, and it can be trained independently of whatever Sora did later on. So as long as you get get a good latent space representation, so you can mix and match this video compression part. Uh, you can put in a new video compression part. You just need to retrain Sora later. But this video compression step uh, can be used with different kinds of models as long as it does some compression that is reconstructable. Okay, all good. So um, the compressed video I just represent like that. Uh, actually, it doesn't look like this. It, it will probably look some latent space that doesn't map back to pixels anymore. Uh, that doesn't look like pixels. But just for illustration, I just blur it out a bit. Okay, so next step is uh, from compressed video to space-time patches. So then we apply the for each of this compressed video. So the compressed video likely will still be some form of a grid. Okay, that can still be using uh, that can still use vision transformers to to map it. So I have I didn't draw as many squares as what this image is, but you can understand that like each of these squares will map to one of this. So uh, we do the transformer operation now. Okay that takes in this latent space and map it into uh, the vision transformer tokens. So actually this is something quite new because like vision transformers typically work on pixel space. But Sora apparently makes vision transformers work on latent space. So if anything, this is this is some uh like this is a mind-blowing thing, right? Because um Previously, we have, uh, we have stable diffusion trying to make like compositional nets work in latent space. Here we have Sora trying to make vision transformers work on latent space, and you know, somehow we can interpret the latent space as an image as well and apply the vision transformer step to it, and, and that to me is pretty cool, right? So, given the compressed input video already compressed, extract out the space time pat patches. Okay, this scheme works for images too. Seems to be images are just videos within a single frame. So you know what this is telling me? It means that in this compressed video here, the time dimension is likely preserved. I mean, maybe they, they just group times together, but because since Sora can also work for a single slice of image, you cannot just make the time dimension gone completely. So this time dimension probably is done independently and the compression maybe is just done in the space domain. And then this time they just, you know, pick intermediate frames maybe. Yeah. So, so this, if this schema can work for images too, it likely means that this time dimension here is using a separate algorithm than the space dimension. Okay, if not, if you if you alias it too much, you, you can't get it to, to, to work for a single image. Yeah, so this um I don't have the full details of this, but this is just some guesses of mine. All right. So the patch page representation enables Sora to train on videos and images of variable resolutions, durations, and aspect ratios. Later I have a slide for that. Okay, at interface it, in, in inference time, you can control the size of generated videos by arranging randomly initialized patches in an appropriately sized grid. So this is the key thing that I discovered from the web page is that probably at the start state, okay, I'm just going to emphasize here, at start state, you already decide your duration and resolution and aspect ratio of your video by providing this size, this array of an appropriate size. So what this means is that, you know, if let's say Sora is eventually released to the public and you have your prompt saying like, I want a video with a 2048 by 2048 res of one minute long of, of, of this event. You no, know, there could be a separate interpreter step maybe using GPT-4 or something, interpret what is the size of this array. Because they need to initialize this array with something in an appropriately sized grid. They need to initialize with something, which means that this space-time patch will determine how long the video is. It will determine how high res the video is. And that is quite cool. Okay, So this is probably something that um, 
that that the transformer by being so versatile and like by expressing each thing as one token, your your main frame of computation is no longer the whole image itself, but the frame of computation is at the token level. You know, you are able to just expand the number of tokens like in, in each dimension. And it, that's an illustration of this. So this um, is purely my speculation. Okay, this is not in the website. But since they mentioned in the previous slide, okay, in, in the, that they do an appropriately sized grid, very likely it's like this. Low rest means that the height and width of this is low. So low rest, this height and width here is uh, likely the resolution. And also aspect ratio also, because you can just um, configure the, the ratio to be different, like height more than width, you can change the aspect ratio. And then this, this thing here at the back, I use a different color. This thing here, the number of frames here is likely the duration. And you know, this may not correspond to each frame one, you know, because of compression, you know, it might be grouping many frames together. But generally, the more frames you have here, the, the, the more um array length you have there, the longer your video. All right. So um they work. I think if I'm not wrong, the resolution is up to 2048 by 2048. And the video length is up to one minute. So that's probably the max step because. After all, this thing is going to, you know, when you do patchify, it's going to be one single row here. So if you know something about transformer attention, because I believe they don't use units anymore, they just use a transformer, like the diffusion transformer to do it. When you do something about transformer, is that the attention scales um, quadratically with the vector length. Because when you do attention, it's usually like vector length n, you need to do n times n attention. Um, that's without fast attention. So if you use fast attention, it's uh, you, you, you can lock this term. But the idea is that you still need to do uh, n times n or something n times something n, which, which means that the amount of vector length you can have, it depends on current technology. If your technology, um, your GPUs are of this size, you know, you cannot have a vector length that's too big. Like this applies for transformers as well. Your, your vector embedding of your tokens can only go up to a certain dimension because your attention mechanism is um is going to be expensive. Like people have bypassed this, like for those long contacts, they don't do attention over the whole thing, they do attention in, in batches, but that loses out some information. It doesn't like you look at like I don't know. Maybe Gemini say they can do one million tokens. Like very likely, some information will be lost. Yeah, because I don't think they do attention across the whole context. So this is a limitation with uh computes of transformers because when we do attention, we typically attend over every single thing in the earlier tokens. So the with technology, I'm quite sure that this resolution and this uh, video length can be increased because you know if you increase the token size, uh, if you increase your vector embedding size, you can quite clearly increase your resolution and your duration as well. Can I chime in? Yeah, yeah, go ahead. I feel like in Gemini, they, they managed to increase the contact length result, result like doing those um, things like the sparse attention or the hierarchy. Okay. Mm -hmm. Now how, how do they do it? Because they, I don't know, but the problem, the thing is they pass the needle in a haystack um, test, right? So the, if you, if you if you lost information, you cannot you cannot pass that kind of test, right? Maybe they do, right? <laughs> what do you mean? That means they, they use the earlier parts of the text as right to condition the output. <laughs> what do you mean? Oh, I mean they can store the earlier parts of the context as like some documents that they refer. You mean, you mean right? Uh, a right could be inbuilt in the model. I mean, these are all speculation. We don't have the details of Gemini. I I feel like if just use, just using Ray, it won't be such a big thing. So... I, I I don't know. Yeah, but I I don't think we can scale attention up so well. That's my that's my point of view. We can't, but maybe they can. I don't. I but I'm doubtful. Very doubtful. But I don't have the details, so I can't comment further. Yeah. Okay. So uh, uh sorry. Sorry. Uh, anything else you want to add before I move on? Oh. Okay. So we go to diffusion transformer. So what is diffusion transformer? Essentially, this is in pixel space. Uh, but what happens is that, you know, when we do this transformer, you actually need to do the compressed space, which will not look like image at all. It will... So we actually have two other spaces. This is the compressed latent space. 
And then if you remember later, we also have another space, which is the uh, vision trans I guess quite the vision transformer space. Okay, this uh, this will basically be the the embedding like that. Yeah. So essentially, we are operating on the vision transformer space. But you know, if you do because when you do your vision transformer like that, okay, if you don't apply any like MLP on this space to this space, uh, essentially this this likely is reversible. It has to be reversible. If not, you can't construct. Likely, this vision transformer space to this compressed latent space is reversible. And then this compressed latent space, because it's some autoencoder, is also reversible to here. To here. So uh, when I talk about diffusion transformer, actually, you know, um, we are talking about this space here. We are referring to diffusion in the vision transformer space. Yeah, I actually don't have a nicer word to use this because I want to say latent space, but because Sora does one step of compressed latent space here already, this is like a second latent space, right? So maybe we can call it the latent latent space, but we can also call it the vision transformer space. So let's just talk about vision transformer space here. So we do diffusion in the vision transformer space, but if you map back to the image pixel space, you will get this. So initially we have noise in the pixel space. We train the prediction objective to you know, predict, um, remove some noise as prediction objective. Okay, so there are a few ways to do this. Is one way is to predict the noise. Okay, um, dog eat two predicts the latent vector itself, and they say that this works better than predicting the noise. And you know, um, if OpenAI is uh, building this on dog E series, is quite likely predicting the latent vector, which is predicting this transformer vector directly also. So. I don't know because I go at the architecture, but I kind of think that OpenAI would follow their DOI models, which means that they predict the latent vector directly. Okay, go to the DOI paper for details on this. I have this in the attached slides also. So, uh, likely is predicting the latent vector, or if you are talking about stable diffusion, you're predicting the noise. Yeah. So, the thing is, if you predict the noise, you can reverse the process and remove those noise. You can also remove the noise. Keep doing that until you get quite a clear image, and basically that's what's given here. Given noisy patches and conditioning information like text prompts is trained to predict the original clean patches, not as a single step, but as a series of diffusion steps so that you know you make the problem easier. So it's very cool because you see vision transformers make the problem easier in the space-time domain. Diffusion makes the problem easier in noisy patches to clear patches domain. So there's a lot of like breakdown into smaller steps kind of thing going on here. And that's really cool. That's really cool because um, Maybe that's what we need to do to, to get good prediction machines. You just don't predict all at one go. You predict in, in a series of short and um, um, accurate steps. Maybe that's the trick to predicting general machines. All right. And this is my own view. I feel like because of the way you do space-time patches, you know, you could just make one, one, uh, one patch noise and the rest clear. Okay. So like maybe this one is all completely noise and the rest over here is, is based on the original video. What you can do is you can do next frame prediction by just predicting the next frame or previous frame. Okay, you condition on text prompt and you also condition on earlier frames. So this is very cool because if this is really possible, we have attained self-supervised learning for videos. You know, I, I've been talking about my previous videos uh, that um, image domain or video domains, we haven't achieved self-supervised learning yet. But if this is true, this is self-supervised learning for videos. And I think that's very powerful. Yeah, I, I, I'm I actually quite impressed with this whole Sora architecture because it looks feasible to do next frame prediction using vision transformer patches. It looks very feasible. And because of the diffusion method, it solves the problem of high dimensionality because you, you can have a high dimension prediction, but if you just predict bits by bit, it, it makes prediction easier. Okay, there's also something else um, because, you know, in trans, uh, in the stable diffusion, you predict noise as your objective. Video is something different. Okay, in video, let me just write a video. In video, you have different frames here. So let's say I have a ball over here. The ball goes somewhere here now, and the ball goes somewhere here next, and then the ball goes somewhere here later. Okay, can anyone tell me in these four frames of the ball moving from left to right? Do you see that, um, are there any correlations between these images? 
Uh, anyone? Uh, uh, the, the Y vertical axis uh, doesn't change that much. Only the X changes. Okay, uh, that, that's for this video. I mean, if the ball is going diagonally down, then, then the X will change also. But the idea is that in videos, do you agree with me that the frame to frame change is minimal? Like if you look at most of Sora videos, the transition is very, very smooth. Uh, you look at the stable diffusion videos, it's like sometimes a bit more abrupt. Like, but vision, like, but Sora, the, the way they generate videos, very, very smooth, right? Between the frames, the transition is like, like just a turn of the camera angle and so on. You all, you all agree with that, right? So in video, the frames actually are not independent of one another. They actually depend on the first few frames. So one thing is, yes, we can get the transformer prediction objective to predict the frame condition on the earlier frame. And you know, somehow it might get this. Or, okay, this is what I just thought about yesterday. We could have a loss function to minimize um, differences between each frame. So that could also help the um, this whole video learn that, you know, between frames itself, you are supposed to use something very similar. Yeah, that, that could be one way to do it. Or, you know, when you do your next frame prediction here, instead of noise, you know, maybe you give the, the previous frame. Yeah, that, that might be another way to, you know, say that, hey, um, use the previous frame as reference and generate something. So that, that's another idea that I have. But you want to sort of drill into the mind of this transformer that, you know, your, your images are linked, like in this video. So there are two ways to do it. One is loss function. One is just, you know, condition as a, a latent here. I don't know what they use, but you know, those, these two are probable methods because like in stable diffusion for image to image generation, you can also give like an image as the, the starting point and then they can build on that image in the latent space. So, you know, why can't you do that for next frame prediction? You can also give the previous frame as the image starting image and ask it to predict the next frame. Or you could do the loss function. So uh, whatever works. I don't know the full architecture. Uh, this is just my speculation. But I think this might be needed if we are doing video because we don't want the model to generate two different frames for your videos, right? Okay, any questions? So question. Yeah. Why, why the figure here looks like every frame is predicted in parallel? Oh, um, it, it probably is because um, what happens is that when you have the transformer go in the input frame, they also take in the, they probably take in this input frame latent as the input and they output a latent space that is the same dimension as the output. But so, then if this is the case, how do you condition on your previous frames? On your earlier frames? No, you cannot. So it's like, for example, like this, right? I, so like you can ask the, like if you, let's say in a text, I am a blank. So then you can you can train the model to predict I am a student. So it's slightly different from like how we do like like um text prediction because usually we don't put this blank here in the in the prediction. Uh, of, but, but but here we are doing a denoising in parallel, right? I mean that's what the figure shows that like that's why I get it from this week. Yeah, we are doing in uh not not in parallel because you know transformer when you feed token by token is still sequential, right? So the likely what happens is that. If you look at the loss objective of doll E, this is probably what happens. You have a transformer here. So at each layer of the transformer, this is our conditioning here. So you condition on, you know, maybe you condition on text, condition on image. You know, next time maybe, maybe you can condition on posts, you know, and, and so on. So that, that's a maybe next time. But the thing is quite likely over here is the latent space. And then what you get at the output here, you get the latent of the next time step. So this latent is that, that flattened representation earlier. So what this means is that the diffusion transformer might just be doing a transformer operation. All the conditions are at the left and then your latent goes here. And what happens is that we are trying to predict this one. This is the prediction objective. Yeah, uh, that does that make sense? Um, yes. I don't know. Maybe I 
I just misinterpret what this figure is trying to tell. So. Uh, by by uh by earlier and next time step, I'm not referring to the time in the video. By the way, this time step is the stable diffusion time step. So um, this one is like time step diffusion time step zero, and then like this one is diffusion time step time. Yes, I know, I know. The the at time axis in the video is the axis coming out uh coming out of the screen, right? Yeah, yeah. The is is the time step of the time in the video is this one here. So this is different. This is the time of video. So are you saying at each time step for diffusion, um, the later part in the time axis of the video itself is still conditioned on the earlier frames of the video? Yeah, yeah. So this whole latent here is all the past frames and all the present frames all here. And you're just supposed to predict this one, which is basically given this one here, predict this one. Can, can I just annotate something to, to yeah, see? Yeah, yeah, go ahead, go ahead. Yeah. So let's say um th this is the diffusion, diffu this is diffusion time step axis. This is the time axis of the video itself. So the in entire process is um so let's say here is zero, right? So so predict here, here. Here until the whole column then goes to next. And did the whole row. Oh yeah, column. Yep. Yeah. Mm. So it fill in the the patches in this way, right? Uh, it depends on how you um how you make the latent into one column. If you do it column wise, then it's like that. If you do it row wise, then it's. But but this is the diffusion axis. So if we need. Oh, to... oh, 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 oh this is not your okay. If, yeah, then you're right. Yes. Okay. Yeah, so likely this is what is happening because if you want to do diffusion on videos, you probably cannot uh, just do like how you do in stable diffusion anymore. You probably need a smarter way to, to do it. Okay, you still need transformers. Okay, so right now, uh okay, so maybe it's better if I go to the next slide. So there's a huge part of it that is uh regards to how to interpret the text and the image. And one big way is clip. So clip is contrastive uh, embeddings that are map the text, like this pepper the Aussie part into the image here. And how they do it is, uh, if you look at my previous video, they actually go by cosine similarity and they take the highest, basically the correct image text match will be highest. They try to make it high and then all the rest, they'll predict it lower in the contrastive objective. And you know, by doing this, they get quite good representations of this text mapping to this image and, and likewise like that. Now I was quite impressed. I thought clip wouldn't work that well, but, but it surprised me. Clip works pretty well. So likely clip plays a role in the conditioning of the diffusion in terms of conditioning to the text as well. So this is stable diffusion. Okay, I like you all to take this image uh, with a pinch of salt because I don't think Sora uses this stable diffusion architecture. But the, the concept is similar. You map it into latents. And over here in uh, in stable diffusion, they use a VAE loss, okay, which also means training time, you can diffuse and add noise to it. And then because you already have the noisy version, you can predict the less noisy version here. And you can use that as a training objective to you know try to to train this denoising unit to, to do the denoising for each time step. Okay, because you have the ground truth. So how this denoising is done is that they also go through a transformer layer because this Zt is, is a vector. You can pass this vector through a transformer and they put this Zt as the query. And then the keys and values here will be mapped by a certain conditional. So this conditional is a, is a, a flat vector as well. And this basically conditions the um, the latent space here to match better all this. So what, what can be done here? Typically, what can be done is like semantic map is you can like draw in the pixels of where you want the tree, where you want the like semantic map is like that. You can say this is your tree. And then like this is your sky and so on. Then you can match those in the semantic map. Text, you can just say like um, a picture. This is what people usually do, like a picture of a dog photorealistic, you know, that kind of nonsense that, uh, not nonsense, but this kind of like descriptions of how 
or you can say um the, the image is you could have other representations as well or you could condition on your image like you give a sample image to change something uh, like you can also in pain you can out pain or, i mean these are other variations of like how you can do do this because you can use this as a condition thing all this goes through to become a flat vector and then you can use that as a key and value here and then the query would be adjusted based on like how similar this query is to your key and value will be updated accordingly uh, so just a disclaimer uh, i don't agree with this okay because <laughs> because for transformers to work your query and key space should be same so it should be similar okay um i think stable diffusion got it wrong <laughs> they shouldn't have done this okay but if you take a look at stable diffusion tree okay um the q k and b are all similar spaces now so uh, i think stable diffusion got it wrong here like i don't get why they put key and value here like in the traditional transform architecture the query key and value are all the same vector values like I think they're trying to do the encoder decoder model of the transformer because usually the key value comes from the encoder, which maybe is here, and the decoder is here. But in the encoder decoder model, you know, even the encoder is like mapped to the same space. Um, here, I'm not sure whether it maps to the same space. And also another thing that uh, Stable Diffusion did is that they used the click text embedding to map your text. Okay. And uh, for images, okay, they also might be using the clip image embedding but so far what i see in the image to image uh, notebook is that the image will go directly here they just put the latent here as your you put the image goes through the vae go through the diffusion and then this will be your starting image in your zt at least that's why I, see. I, I might be wrong so at least this is how i see it done but the details are uh, not too important the idea is important the idea is that we have a noisy latent image we train this denoising architecture. It may not be a unit or so. We just train the denoising architecture to predict the vector space that is denoised. And we already have some ground truth here we can compare with in training. And this prediction process, we can condition it on stuff like, you know, your text or image. You know, you can even condition it in your time step, you know. There are many ways you can condition it. So the idea is a condition prediction process of this denoise latent. How you do it, up to you. But this is how stable diffusion does it. Yeah, and it works pretty well. Yeah, I don't fully agree with how they did this architecture. Okay, so the QKB, in my opinion, should, should be in a similar space. Yeah, so this is stable diffusion. Uh, any questions on this stable diffusion? Okay, so how likely the video is done? Again, I'm just using the stable diffusion as like a basis here. The but. I'm quite sure that they don't use UNET in Sora, right? So first we use some form of um, you know, compression. And the compression could be variation of the encoder or VQBAE for the image frame. And for the video compression in the time axis, they probably just like interpolate between time frames and then just squash them together like that. Okay, so this is one way of doing it. And then you get a video level linear vector instead of an uh, image level vector you get a video level vector which contains the time frames so like each time frame could be like one slice here of your so so in the traditional sense this is your image latent okay so you go through the diffusion process and then you can condition on a lot of things um you can condition even on a starting video okay but if you condition on a starting video likely it will be here the slightly the conditioning will be here because it makes more sense to put the video as your latent directly. Like you go through the video, uh, the video goes through the um the compression and so on, and then out comes the video here. Yeah. So so this is how you condition videos. Like we not 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 through this objective here. All right. Um, you can condition on text, and uh, this is very interesting. The text they use from the DOI tree captioning model that um can caption videos pretty well using some hierarchical recursive method of generating the captions. Okay, so this is something that OpenAI has an advantage of. They have this uh, closed source model of captioning the video, which captures the overall video dynamics. They can use that as a condition for the training as well. So what um, is typically done is that this text will go through some clip embedding. All right. Um, and also in the DOI 2 paper, they also use the encoded tokens directly. So, so you don't go through clip, you go through encoded. And you know, somehow this, 
this actually helps to preserve the meaning of the text even more, right? You know, you saw the earlier text prompt about the woman in Tokyo and so on. Such a long prompt. You go through clip embeddings, um, I think most of the information will be, will be lost. So very likely, there will be some encoded tokens directly here. You can look at the DAW E2 objective. They also use that. Directly, this will be used for condition as well. Okay. So if you have like other things that you want to say that, oh, this is your starting video, but you know, I kind of want to make sure that the ending video is of a certain, um, like you want to interpolate between uh, the last video, maybe you could have a video embedding and then you can put the, the video embedding here also to just say that, hey, you know, you need to get more and more accurate stuff uh, towards the end. And quite likely, the conditioning might be done separately across time, uh, across time in the video. Because, you know, maybe the first part of the video, you want it to be doing this thing. Second part, you want to do it. Second, third one might be doing something else. So, you know, you, you might condition it separately. Or if you know, if you have a click text to video embedding, which is possible to be trained, you can also put the video embedding directly as the conditioning on the entire video. So you can make this video here look very close to like whatever video you want to condition on. Uh, so these are just some methods of doing it. Uh, again, I don't have the full architecture for this, so whatever I say is just speculation, but the idea is the same. You have this latent space here, you do a denoising step with some conditions, and how you get this condition is up to you. You want text, image, video, uh, maybe next time you can have post estimation and so on. You can just put them as one of the conditioning things in your transformer, and you know it may not even be this method. It may be like what I showed you earlier. You have this transformer here, and all your conditioning is here. So all your conditions is at is at the first half because this will form the context for your later half, and then this will be your image late. This will be your video later, and then you predict the new video later. So how you do this conditioning up to you. Okay, I'm just showing you like how this probably is done. And you know, after I read through 20 over papers on stable diffusion, I realized that you know maybe the math is not important. You no, know, the main thing is next latent prediction, which is like next token prediction. So you know, all the math about flow, flow, um, flow conditioning and so on, the uh, elbow, elbow loss. In the end, it turns out that even the coefficient of all these losses are not important. Yeah, you just need the next latent prediction. And you know, somehow that lost term becomes the next latent prediction. They put that whole complicated two page of math in the paper. I don't think that's important at all. Yeah. So a bit controversial here, but I don't think the math for stable diffusion is important. The main thing is just the next latent prediction. Okay, questions here. Okay, this is uh, more or less where I want to pause for a while. If you all have anything you want to ask on this stable diffusion, or rather this stable diffusion converted to Sora kind of architecture. Okay, good. Let's move on. There will need about 15 more minutes, so um, don't mind I exit a bit. So um, this is a paper on the Sora. They kind of, um, it's not the official paper, but they kind of say that like how Sora could have been made. And um, I would like to say I disagree with uh, like about 80% of the paper, but I agree with this diagram. So I'm showing you this diagram here. <laughs> so, so over here, what they did is that, okay, we also encode the pixel into, uh, into a latent space. And this encoding is done in two parts. First part, compression. Second part is the VIT transformation. And my speculation is that this vision transformer transformation is a reversible one. Like when you transform into this latent space here, you probably preserve the entire details of your compression. It's just that you make it into patches. Okay, because if you do the traditional like MLP transformation for your VIT, you know, there's no way you can get it back there. Or rather, there's a way, but you know, you may not get back such a crypt image. So this VIT transformation is probably a reversible one. Is it the normalizing flow thing? Normalizing, um, not not really. No. So the vision transformer transformation is just maybe like if you look at the earlier diagram, it's just from here twelve flattened to here. That's all. Like we we don't do any uh, any linear projection. Like we just do it up to here. So, so this is just my uh, 
what I think it is because if you do like the vision transformer with the linear projection, I'm not sure whether you can linear project back into this nice pixel space again. Yeah. So I'm not sure if that matches whatever you're talking about, the uh, normalized flow. I'm not sure. It's just that's the that's the method I, I'm aware that it's a... Uh, Is it reversible? Reversible, yes. Yes. Then maybe they use normalized flow. Later, you link me the paper. Yeah. So um, this is something that is done for the encoder part. So we get this space-time latency. I like the name, space-time latency. Yeah. <laughs> so this space-time latency, we can add noise to it. And then we have this, this vec let's call this the video latency. Okay? Let's call this the video latency. And then we have all this conditioning. So this condition can come from like um, text that is likely GPT-4. Okay. And the uh, image or video frames that could likely be video click, uh, video based click. Or you know the video, uh, video condition can come here also. Uh, you, you you need not do the the condition down here. Okay, you can also do the conditioning here. Okay, because if your latent space starts off not as random noise, but you know you start off with some meaningful pictures here already, you can compress into your space time patches add noise. That will come as a conditioning as well. Okay. So this conditioning here will be doing what will be brought into this diffusion transformer block, which let me emphasize again, this is how I think it looks like. You have a transformer. All your conditions will come here. And your latents will come here. And then you predict the next latent is here. So this is a very clear cut transformer block uh, that takes in conditions plus current latents and predicts next step. I, I think that's all you need for stable diffusion, actually. You, you don't need such a complicated QKV or this. You just need some transformer that can do this. And uh, I think OpenAI uses something like this. They just haven't disclosed this yet. Um, the rest of the academic community is uh, still doing the very complicated way that stable diffusion is doing. But you know, maybe this is enough. Yeah, and all your conditioning, all your various con conditioning, like even like your control net and so on, you know, you want to do it here as various ways to condition. You know, as long as you can represent it as a vector here, you know, go ahead, you can you can just put them into this conditioning block. You can just put it here. So it's a very, very simplified architecture. I always like to say that, you know, if the idea is not simple enough, it's probably because we haven't found the right idea. Maybe this is the, the way to do it. Yeah, I'm, I'm not a domain expert in this, but you know, uh, it just irks me to see the stable diffusion paper because it's too complicated in my opinion. Too too much stuff. Yeah, I, I think this is enough already. If we can do something like that. Yeah. So you do this diffusion across multiple time steps uh, in the training phase because you have the latents from this uh, noising process. You can you can have the ground truth here to you know condition your your um diffusion block to you know how know how to predict the denoise latent at each step through the through the ground truth because you 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 add noise step by step. Right. So eventually, once you get the denoise um, latent here, you can go back into the space time blocks again. Okay. As you can see, I don't draw 3D stuff quite well, but this is the space time block. After that, you can reverse your VIT transformation. And then after that, you can reverse your compression. And then you get back your image space. Easy, right? Looks sounds very easy, right? So if this is truly the way they did it, you know, I'm I'm very happy because this uh, appeals to my sense of um, um this appeals to my sense of how learning is done. <laughs> like you, you don't need to do mean flows and everything, because our brain probably doesn't work like that. Yeah. But uh, you know, if if you want to do like, a prediction objective like that, just conditioning on the next latents. Like that, if, if this really works out, it's good enough. Yeah, in fact, I'm, I'm motivated to try out something like this on my own also using MNIST. So you stay tuned for that. Uh, you see whether you can um, get stable diffusion performance with such a simple method. All right, uh, questions on this? Uh, sorry, this might be a bit of a digression. I was just curious, do you have a previous background in biology? Because previously you were talking about how the, the eye works and circadian and all that. 
Oh no. Um, in my years of PhD, I just read widely. I read neuroscience, psychology, biology, and so on. Oh, okay, okay. that's great. So, yeah, so it comes from like my, my various uh, reading experiences. Okay, thanks. Yeah. Uh, any other questions? Okay, let's move on. So um, as you can see in the diffusion time step, as we diffuse more and more, we get clearer and clearer videos. So this is from the official website. Like this is the baseline. You know, you can see it's very blurry. It's still a bit of noise. You, you add in more time to remove the noise. You know, you can get this. And then after that, wow, look at that. Even the texture of the grass is captured. Yeah, so um, this is the power of um, denoising step by step. If you have more compute, you can denoise more. You know, you can get more clearer and high res videos. So you no, know, somehow diffusion you know, solves the high res problem or super resolution problem. Because you can get higher res by removing more and more noise. <laughs> so that that's that's something that is quite cool because people have been doing super super resolution as a separate problem. But you know, diffusion just kind of solves it just like that. Yeah. So the more time you spend doing the diffusion, the higher quality of your images are going to be just by the nature of, uh, by removing noise, you're making the image more crips. So, so far, this is uh, what I've gained from reading the papers of diffusion. And yeah, if you can just use Sora for a longer compute time, you will get better quality images. Uh, I'm not sure whether the video, um, like the how, how good the frames are from start to end would improve the diffusion. I suppose yes or so. But, I'm I'm quite sure that there's some additional objectives to make sure that frame to frame transition is smooth. Maybe some loss objective to minimize changes between frames, or just simply putting in the next frame as the latent space for that for that frame in the space time latent. Yeah, so there, there are ways to do it. So some more speculation is like no control net. So one day I'll cover control net also. Control net just adds on to stable diffusion block by creating a new block. So this is the traditional transformer block for stable diffusion, maybe. Control net creates another block here that has certain conditions here. And then they just join them together like that. So control net is used because the baseline stable diffusion didn't um, didn't condition on other stuff like you know that map and other stuff. So I believe they train it using a uh, LoRa, low rank domain of adaptation. And then you know they kind of they, so these details may be wrong because I'm just going off the cuff. Um they freeze this part here, and then they train this part here, and then eventually they just add back the, the, the two parallel flows. So the idea is that you know you could use ways to condition on other things in your diffusion step. You can con condition on your sketch, condition on human pose. It's pretty remarkable, by the way. Look at this. Yeah, so this is all in the commercial tools already. Like you can use this in uh, Meet Journey and so on. Yeah, I, I think it's pretty cool that you can just condition like that. So this is something that can be done for videos or so. And I think for videos, in fact, your conditioning for videos, you can condition on certain frames, like start frame, end frame, middle frame, and so on. And because of maybe some loss objective in the, in, in the video, you know, you can make the start to the middle smooth because of that, of, of, of the interframe objective. So if you condition at the start, condition at the end, condition at the middle, maybe you get a very smooth video already. Yeah. And you could do something like what you do for control net or images. Or if you have a set of conditions for the whole video, you know, you, you might just apply them frame by frame for video. Yeah. The thing is, I don't know how the compression is done frame by frame. Like quite likely they'll skip certain frames and so on. So this may be hard to do for the whole video, but you know, you might be able to do this at a frame level. So yeah, this is just some things that could be done for, for Sora. It would be quite cool, right? Imagine you can condition say that, hey, my first uh, part of the image, I want it to look like a door. And then the last part of the video, I need to look like a shoe. So then it can morph. <laughs> so this is, uh, I think they have some, thing, some things on video interpolation and uh, Video interpolation, I realized that the start and end videos are the same length. The, the left video and, and, and the right video, same length. So what they could have done is that they could have done something like that. So you take in the frame for left video times a certain weight. 
last frame for left right video times a certain weight. Okay, and then you just do some form of like maybe you do one minus weight one. Yeah, so you can just interpolate from the left side to the right side through time. All right, and essentially that's what I see for the video interpolation. Towards the end, it looks like the right video. At the start, it looks like the left video. So they probably have some form of conditioning per image. Okay, at first I was thinking they might have conditioned it over the video, but the more I think about it, if you condition by video, quite likely it, you know, you are not able to get such a smooth transition because if you condition by video across the whole video frame, a uh, video latent, you're gonna influence the whole video uniformly. But you know, you kind of want to influence each image of the videos differently. So the more I think about it, this kind of feels right. Like you, the conditioning might be done at a frame level and you can just condition by image at a certain thing. And because of the, because of interframe similarity objective, you get smooth video. Okay, at least this is uh, how I think about it right now. So as you can see, the slides here are a little different from my explanation because after reading like 10 over papers yesterday, I have a different view right now. So this is uh, my latest view. Questions for this? Okay, let's move on. So these are the questions to ponder, but before I move on to the questions to ponder, let me just highlight some of the other work from for latent spaces. It's like, you know, for IJAPA, VJAPA, they predict like catches of the image like that, which I don't agree with because um, I think in the prediction problem, you should go by time frames. And like even for predicting the next frame, they also predict like what's missing in the frame, which I also don't agree. We should just predict the next frame. So that's something that I think um, this part didn't do that well. Make a video, um, they basically just interpolate between the frames. Okay, it lacks the video context because the text over here doesn't contain the, the, the video stuff. So that's quite likely where OpenAI has an advantage because they have the DOI tree captioning model. So the text conditioning will have more context. So this is what I want to emphasize. So for DOI2, okay, they actually use the click objective quite well because this part here is the image clip latent after they condition on everything. And then they use this as a diffusion process start point to, you know, to, to, to get back your image. So this to me is a few more natural than stable diffusion because stable diffusion just puts the click text objective, but there's nowhere that they use the click image objective. So this is more natural for using click in my opinion. And so basically given a text encoder, we do some form of, uh, some form of prior um, matching, okay? in order to get the image clip latent. And then we use that through some diffusion process to get back your image. And you know you could also do this for a video. You, know, you could have a video encoder here. Okay, or you could split your image into different frames and then you encode the start frame, middle frame, end frame, and then you interpolate. That could be a way. So different ways of doing it. Uh, but the reason why I want to highlight this is because of this. So in the doll E2 embedding, they take in encoded text click text embedding, embedding for diffusion time step, the noise click image embedding, and the finder embedding whose output is used to predict the... So this means that it kind of fits the, the thing is, you have conditions here. These are your conditions. This is your current latent space, which is this one, the noise click image embedding. This one, the final embedding whose output is used might just be, you know, like some random noise here. And then over here is used to do L prime. Now I'm not sure why you cannot do L prime directly here, but this is at least what I got from the DOI2 paper. And you know, maybe this is all is needed instead of stable diffusion. Okay, so um, some background. So let's move to questions to ponder. <clears throat> so first question I'd like to ask you all is, you know, when they say that they get the compressed latent space from videos, how do they do it? <laughs> so right now I propose, you know, they use VQ, VAE, or VAE for image frames, and then some form of time scape for, for um, the time the dimension, like group time frames together. Any comments on like how to get the compressed part? I think the key thing is you need to preserve 
time independency. Yeah, you cannot you, you cannot alias the time information separately because if you do that, you will get quite inaccurate time output. Yeah. At least this is what I think. I think the, the compression is done image frame level. And after that, for the time level, you, you just pick certain frames up. Uh, any, any other comments for this? Okay, so I guess you all agree with this. Next, how can the clip for text encompass so much nuance about the video description? Because as you all know, uh, clip embeddings are lossy. So how do they preserve info of such a long form? Besides, I gave like a potential answer somewhere. Anyone want to answer this? How, how did they preserve the original text description itself? Uh, anyone? Okay, yeah. So anyway, the, the idea is that um, they feed in the encoded tokens without any compression. So this, this is done in Dolby 2. And I think they do the same thing again for, for, for this Sora. Yeah, in fact, if you look at Stable Diffusion 3, that's similar. They use the T5 encoding. Yeah, so this is something that I think is an improvement over stable diffusion because stable diffusion yeah, does the clip um, embedding for the text itself. If your text is too long, you will lose out information about that. Okay, next, would Sora be a good simulator? So as you can see, Sora, if you give it, like, you train it on the world itself, it might predict plausible interactions of like how people walk, how people move and so on. And, you know, they even have a, Minecraft, they kind of predict like how the character will move in Minecraft. So would Sora be a good simulator to to you know condition robot like to to form to, to do a sort of a world model for robots or cognitive agents? Uh, any comments? Do you think we can use Sora to to do a world model so we can just condition as the text like move less, and then your video could be the current current video. Uh, current uh, current frame plus previous frames, and then you predict next frame. Can we use Sora for next frame prediction like that? Maybe not yeah. at the moment. Okay, why? There's still issue, right? Because like the example you showed, the the dragon, the dragon one. So it's definitely not the, not 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 there yet. Mm -hmm. Yes. So I think that is not there yet because maybe the training set doesn't have this kind of move left, move right. Like when people do videos, we don't na naturally say like, hey, um, the person moves left, then move right, then move left, then move right. You know, they will, they will just say the person walking in the sakura flower, um, with sakura flowers dropping. You know, they, we, we won't go into the details of move left, move right. Uh, recently, I saw a paper that says that, you know, even, uh, like if, even if you use the diffusion models, uh, but you, you make the data set emphasize on positions, you know, somehow um, the generation can, can do positions. Like you can, you can do like cat on left, dog on right. So initially I, I talked about like how vision transformers like lose out the information of position in the picture, but it turns out that actually it may still preserve that because you know, technically, a vision transformer doesn't lose the information of the image itself, right? It just converts into a different representation. So this is something that I think, you know, a lot of things is based on the data set. How we, how we do the text prompt for the videos or the image. So if by just emphasizing on the positions in the in the in, in training set, we can already get quite accurate descriptions of your position. If in the training set you give this particular actions of what we did. So like your robot, robot knows the action. Okay, so you can fine tune it on the um, video frames or the image frames of what it has experienced and predict next frame of the current state. So you could do some form of fine tuning on the go. So um, this sort of fine tuning is very similar to, you know, when you look at my paper, the learning fast and slow, uh, you can actually 
train the fast neural network or rather the, the neural network to, to do instant prediction. You can train it on the current experience as well. You can keep training it using hippocampal replay and so on. I'm quite sure something like Sora that is capable of, at least uh, hypothetically, capable of next frame prediction. You can train it with more specific text prompts like, oh, the robot move left, move right. You know, if you can fine tune this of what you have experienced, right? And, you know, just do the next frame prediction. I think it can be quite a reliable world model, actually, because it's predicting in latent space. So if your world, um, the way you compress your world is similar to how Sora compresses the world at the beginning, you know? Um, yeah, I think it's a pretty good simulator, provided the, the distribution is the same, of course, for how you compress your world versus how the, the training sets in the world compress it. Yeah. So I think right now, no, it's not a great simulator yet because we currently don't have the very refined text prompts to make it a simulator. But if you train it, I do know a data set that has those kind of prompts. Maybe it can be a good simulator. Yeah, I, I'm quite optimistic about it. Actually, I have a question here. What are the existing pro what are the problems with the existing simulator? Why would we want something like Sora to help? Oh, uh, existing simulations don't do next image prediction. Like Sora is doing next image prediction in the latent space. Why do you need that? Uh so that you can like maybe predict what your action would be. <laughs> but, like, but, but you see in those state of the art game engine, like how like those are super like super ultra realistic. So why don't you just use those as the training environment? Why would you also there's in it's it's like fully deterministic, right? It's nothing not grounded, right? So why would why would you choose something like Sora over there? Mm, I mean, one thing is web scale training. It might be able to learn implicit stuff about how things move and so on. So I I would say it's like chat GPT, you know, like if you have a, a way to do semantic prediction, like happy set and stuff, why use ChatGPT to do it? The thing is ChatGPT has seen a lot more. It probably can generalize to out of distribution much better than, you know, that specialized model can. So the same case for Sora. Sora has seen the world's videos. I'm pretty sure if you fine tune it well, it should be able to do a good simulator job. And then the question is, why do we need a simulator? If we were to do like Daniel Kahneman's system one, system two thinking, if we want to do system two thinking, we probably need some form of planning. And you can't plan if you cannot predict what's going to happen next. So a simulator is needed for cognitive agents. It's just that previously, my my bet has been with Lekun. Lekun says it's impossible to do image predict or video prediction because it's a too high dimension latent space. So I think that's true. But the thing is, if you do in the latent space, you may be able to predict. Yeah, so I, I, do, I do think there's potential for the simulation here. Uh, tell you that, does that uh, answer the question? Uh, I need some time to digest and continue. Yeah, uh, okay, so can you ask, if novelty is that diffusion process is done parallel, how would you downstream it to a next frame prediction? Oh, um, so, Next frame prediction is basically like, you know, you know, the video latent that we talked about earlier. We are just predicting the entire video latent again, like at each time step. And, you know, if you just have a noisy version of the, the next frame, when you do the next time step prediction, you do it over a diffusion model, you might get back the very clear latent that can be used to, you know, to go predict the next frame. Right. So, so essentially, it's like asking if you go into token spaces. Like I say, I am a blank. You you pass this into ChatGPT and you ask it to predict this, and then you get back, I am a student. So essentially, this is how it's done. You can just blank off certain parts of your input space, and then you can get the the prediction like that. So that's how you do next frame prediction in in like diffusion process. You can just give a noisy input for that certain things you want to predict, and then you can get the 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 clear input after you do the diffusion process. I'm not sure if that answers that question. <laughs> yeah. So a, a bit different from next token prediction because we kind of still need to give it a token. We cannot just uh, give it nothing. Like the next token prediction, you can just say, I am a, and then you get ChatGPT to reply student. Here you need to give, I am a noisy something. Then 
by the diffusion process, you get back the denoise version. Okay. Um, so this thing here, one caveat about simulation is for most cognitive processes, you don't have to map back the pixel space. So you think about it, like if I throw you a ball right now, do I need you to reconstruct the ball pixel by pixel for you to catch it? Okay, so, so okay, this is a bit messy here. Let me just re redraw here. For most cognitive processes, you don't need to plan in pixel space. Okay, so this is the question I have to ask everyone. If I throw you a ball right now, do you need to reconstruct the ball pixel by pixel over the next few frames in order to predict how to catch it? Who here thinks that you can catch the ball without even going back to pixel space? You can put your hand up. I don't think the humans have even pixel space processing. Yes. We're not like right. Robocop, you know? All right, all right. So you look at stable diffusion, it takes so long to process back to pixel space. You try to do that, humans will, will be dead, all right? The moment you see a tiger chasing after you, you try to process back the pixel space, gone. I thought you'd be eaten up. So most cognitive decisions don't need pixel space to do it. So in order to do simulation for cognitive processes, maybe you don't need the full diffusion. Maybe all you need to do is to go into latent space and use that for prediction. That's all. Okay, so I would say that the whole predictive architecture without diffusion might already be good enough for cognitive processes. So we don't need like Sora level clear pixel stuff. You you can just make your plan in, in latent space. And you know, uh, later we talk about the last question. So that, that, that will be how uh, I think we can do cognitive agents as well. Once we, uh, I'll talk more about it in the last question. Uh, any other points to add for our simulation part? Okay. So the last, oh, sorry, the second last thing I'll ask is, you know, Sora is not very good at physics. How do we get Sora to know physics better? Like um, know that an object will drop down in an environment. Okay, so this is, uh, before I answer the question, uh, anyone has any comments for this? I think it's a huge unsolved problem. Yeah, all right. So this is my, my intuition, okay? Videos in the web may not obey physics. <laughs> you think about it, all the advertise, all the advertisement, the burger can fly up, you know, that kind of thing. How you want, how do you want Sora to learn physics when your videos are like that? So if you want to imbue physics, you have to curate the videos to only show realistic physics-based videos. Not necessary. You can have a fine-tuning uh, process where the ground truth of fine-tuning is grounded in a physical okay. physic, physical accurate simulation. All right, Ken, I, 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 I grant that. So we can fine-tune also. So I think as long as you choose your videos wisely, because like for us, how do we learn physics? We observe. If I drop my phone down, it goes down. You know, we don't exactly come in built with some form of physics detector in our head. I, I, I this is an assumption. We observe how the world interacts. Like I've been seeing objects drop down since I was born. Right? If suddenly the object floats in there, I have to rebuild my world model. But can I live in a world where things float? Yeah, astronauts do that in the space station. So how we model physics and how we do prediction is very likely based on, you know, um how the real world gives you the input stimuli. So if you want to get accurate physics, I think the easy way is to just make sure that the videos you feed into Sora are accurate in terms of physics and not all videos on the web are accurate in terms of modeling this physics. So you know, like the person running backwards in a treadmill, you know, that is uh, maybe someone did that as a prank or something, you know, there, there are ways that this kind of things can sip into the knowledge for Sora. But if- Actually Actually, that example, right? It doesn't necessarily violate any physical law, right? It's just not. It's not like a fit to our, our yes, uh, right. sense, right? Yeah, yeah. So I think the best way of doing physics is just to give good sample videos. Um, of course, the other way is you know, if you can kind of model like like in Unity game engine or something, you can model some world with physics and use some form of uh, data generation and fine tuning to, to model that, uh, that that will work too. Or, you know, if you can uh, take an image, extract out 3D objects, 
<laughs> with their weights <laughs> info and then you can put them in a, a game simulator you know uh, that that would be the this is the this is the best way for physics but you know is it possible i don't know yeah so if you want accurate physics this is the best way to do it because you no know, at least game engines uh, physics are not too bad like if you look at the Gran Turismo and all this and models cars quite well, I'm sure you can model you know, simulator to model the world quite well. And all you need to do is to form some form of mapping from your image space to the 3D object space with like the object size, object wave, and so on, object weight. Uh, I think that's the most clear cut way to get physics, but it's difficult for videos because you no know, the objects can shift position in videos. How are you gonna model the movement and so on? It's just not not easy. I think the easiest way. It's just in the next frame prediction um, for Sora, just to get it right by giving it the right videos to, to condition on uh, or to learn from. Yeah, so JFCO, you mentioned that fine tuning involves curation of data set. That's exactly right. So if you want to fine tune to your world, you know, you kind of need to give the data set that, that encompasses good physics for that. But if you look at but the mind. If you have. Yep, sorry, sorry, go if ahead. If you have data, you generate data from you. Sorry, can you say that again? If you have a simulator, you you don't need to query data because it will generate the data from you. Oh, I see what I mean. You generate synthetic data. Yes. And you feed it as a fine tuning set, is it? No. Uh you basically I'm framing this problem as some kind of RL training problem. So okay. just at an agent, in this case, the 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 image or the video gener generating agent. Let it run in the environment, and uh, whenever whatever it predicts, uh, just is like so far off, uh, compared to the environment ground truth, then you should just impose some penalty. I'm like, yeah, thinking from that perspective, how do you run the oh, agent? So you are saying that after the video is generated, you run it through some critic agent that critics whether it matches the physics. Uh. Like you just put it in the simulator and see how different it is compared to what the simulation gives you. But you need a uh, ground truth for the simulation, right? Which you may not get uh, the videos the in the box. Right? So the simulation is from the simulation itself, from the simulator. Yeah, right. But you need the input to the simulation. So sometimes the videos from the wow, you can't get it to be in the simulation. To be in the simulation so you then... need to have a customized simulator for your task. Yeah, so basically the fine tuning data set is generated from your simulator, right? That's what I'm saying. You need to use the simulator. But you can guarantee it's grounded in in the as much to the extent of how your simulator is close to the realistic physical, uh yeah. So yeah, so your your data you can, set, you can make it controllable. Yeah, so yes, so this, this doesn't um deviate from the point that you can fine tune on a simulator generated data set. Okay, I guess yeah, in a way yes. Yeah, so uh, essentially, if you ground it on the right data set, I think you can model physics quite well. So I was about to say, I saw their Minecraft videos uh, where they prompt Sora in Minecraft. Um, it generates the physics quite well. And um, this might be because for Minecraft, usually uh, people don't uh, do not do do mods and stuff like that. Like they, they just show the gameplay without like flying hacks and stuff like that. So, so they are able to learn the physics for that well. But for real world videos, there's a non-zero chance that someone might do something like CGI or something. Then if you put that in Sora, Sora is going to learn that. So like, I think this is something that we need to be wary of because with the increase of AI-generated videos, Sora is going to learn more and more of this AI-generated videos and quite likely the physics will be will be gone. <laughs> Not gone, but like it'll be skewed towards those kind of um, advertisement videos or non-realistic videos and you know if you want it to generate accurate physics i think it's fine to to, to pre-train on the web's worth of videos and text no no problem you just need to fine-tune it for your environment you're interested in later on so that you ensure that you don't uh, learn all this <laughs> weird weird behaviors you only fine-tune to what is in your data set that is something like how chat gpt is so generic but you can fine-tune on a specific data set to make it better at it yeah similar concept yeah, that's a good point about um, you know, the YouTube videos being contaminated with all the CGI effects. 
Yeah, I mean, the deep learning models are only as good as your data set. So this is something that we need to bear in mind. We don't have heuristics inbuilt inside there. I mean, the only heuristics are called the conditioning, but the whole objective of how we do the next frame prediction and or next patch prediction is all based on the videos in the wall. So that you just need to bear in mind that. All right, so the last part. So far, video generation, you know, there's many possible answers because, you know, your text is just one thing. If I ask you to give me a, a picture of a bunny running, a, a video of a bunny running, no, nope. there's so many, how so so many correct videos, right? Uh, running, yeah, sorry. So many correct videos because like the bunny can be any size, the running can be any form, the scene background can be anything. Of course, if you can, if you put more and more descriptions here, the number of correct videos are getting lesser and lesser. But video generation is actually an easier problem in some sense compared to taking a video and understanding that video. Okay, because understanding a video can come in many levels. Like so far, like Dolly Tree captioning is probably doing only like like maybe a broad level understanding of the video, but you no. Know, an image itself, like you, I show you an image of a person at a beach and so on. You can interpret this person as doing different things. Like the person could be, okay, this is at a table. The person could be at a table. Like you could literally describe the image, person beside a table. You could also say like person eating at a table. You could also say that this is a dining restaurant and so on. So, so there could be many ways of describing this image. One way is that, you know, your click embedding somehow, you know, could capture maybe like various things about this image, like your click embeddings, you could capture some slice of it. So maybe this could be used for a particular, this could be used as a condition for some other abstraction space. So I'm just going to call it A over here for abstraction space. You can use this here to generate like, different abstraction space, like, you know, broad level, specific level, object level. You no, know? so there are different ways to get different texts for the videos and so on. And, you know, the clip image embeddings I realized are quite versatile, but they are not like specifically engineered to give you um, the, the text at a different kind of uh, skills. Yeah, so maybe what could be done is you could have, like if you are interested in a particular representation, you could maybe give some text to like maybe do visual question answer and so on to ask certain questions about it and then get the the abstraction level you need. So uh, this idea of multiple abstraction spaces, I think we still haven't got there yet because right now when we encode this whole model here, we are encoding all at the starting from pixel level. But if you have some form of way to map this into like object level view, like you get the person coordinates, table coordinates, and so on. And then you, you do some mapping after that, you might get a different abstraction space. So there are different ways to process images. Right now, uh, we don't really do all this. So this different abstraction space could also go inside here to condition your output generation and so on. Uh, so right now we are all focused on pixel space uh, generation. I'm thinking that, you know, there could be other spaces or so. If, you know, could somehow make this into a pose estimation or depth estimation from the image, that could be a different abstraction space and so on. And all this could answer different questions like, is the apple near to me and so on, or like distance abstraction space. You could answer more and more questions about all this with more abstraction spaces other than the pixel itself. Because pixel only tells you certain things. So this is the idea I have. Like, I think there could be such uh, grounded abstraction spaces in different kinds of measurements and objectives that we are interested in. And all this can be used to do some cognitive tasks. So Sora is great. Right now it's doing it only on the pixel space, but maybe we could have other ways to you know process the image in different abstraction spaces for cognitive tasks. Okay, uh, that's all I have for the last question. Uh, anything else you want to add for this? So th this last part is not exactly Sora, it's more like, how can we use such a video generation, you know, to perhaps do cognitive agents? Yeah, that's, that's the kind of thing I'm interested in, actually. Okay, if not, uh, oh, wow, I exceeded by 40 minutes. <laughs> Thanks for staying. Um, so just to summarize, I think Sora is a very important breakthrough 
because what it's able to do is able to encode any length of video uh, up to one minute with different resolution into the space time patches. And it's able to condition it on certain things like text prompts, image prompts, even video prompts and so on. And this implicitly also could enable it to do next frame prediction for videos, which is something very powerful. So I do think that Sora has potential, not only being a video generator, but also a next frame predictor or next state predictor, and it could also be used in world models. So that's uh, where I'd like to end off today. And yeah, thanks for coming. See you next time.